Praise be to God. God bless you, my dear friends. We love you very, very much. And on this Friday within the octave of Easter, this holy Easter day, I wish you every hope and joy in the resurrection, even in the midst of affliction. And I'm going to read to you today a letter that I found, an open letter from a woman to Pope Francis. And it is what I sense, what I hear from many, many people. The sadness, if you will, the confusion, the hurt, and the pain that many, many people are feeling right now. And that's why I, I think it's necessary to share with you those sentiments and that they're that you're not alone and that in fact I want to give you encouragement to trust to God from the liturgy of this very day so we're gonna read the prayers from the office of the readings and go through the liturgy of the mass today that we may be able to see clearly and understand and take courage and draw strength from the promises of the Lord. At the Lamb's high feast we sing praise to our victorious King who has washed us in the tide flowing from his wounded side. Praise the Lord whose love divine gives his sacred blood for wine, gives his body for the feast. Christ the victim, Christ the priest. Where the paschal blood is poured, death's dark angel sheaths his sword. Israel's host in triumph go through the waters that drown the foe. Christ the Lamb whose blood was shed, Paschal victim, Paschal bread, let us with a fervent love taste the manna from above. The Holy Eucharist, the manna from above, the Holy Mass. Mighty victim from on high, powers of hell now vanquished lie. Sin is conquered in the fight. You have brought us life and light. Your resplendent banners wave. You have risen from the grave. Christ has opened paradise. And in him all men shall rise. Easter triumph, Easter joy. Sin alone can this destroy. Souls from sin and death set free. Glory in their liberty. Hymns of glory, hymns of praise. Father, unto you we raise. Risen Lord, for joy we sing, let our hymns through heaven ring. We praise you for the, the sweet words, Lord, and for the sweet tune. And we make it our own. We are not overwhelmed or overburdened by the happenings of our days. Open letter to Pope Francis. 
Beloved Holy Father Francis, you are loved by God our Father, by Jesus our Savior, Son of God and Son of Mary, by the Holy Spirit who called you to be the Chief Shepherd of Christ's Church. You are tenderly loved by our Mother Mary who cherishes all the shepherds of her Son's Church. Thanks be to God that they have placed their love for you in my heart. What a beautiful woman. <laughs> I remember that I was pleased with you when you first became Pope. I was pleased with the name you chose, Francis. What a beautiful patron, St. Francis of Assisi, a great saint of love for all people, especially the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters, and for all God's creation. God bless the Holy Saint Francis. I remember that I was pleased that you didn't want to live like a king in the palace of the Vatican. You chose to live in a humble residence and to wear more humble attire. In many ways, you identified with and drew to yourself the poor and the outcast. What a beautiful model for all Christians. Not only Catholics, but millions of other people all over the world listen to what you say and they watch what you do. But now it appears to me that you have wandered from the beautiful path that you started from. And as you strayed from the path of light that you were on, you are leading many people into the dark wilderness of this sinful world. What has happened to the rod and the staff that the Good Shepherd handed to you when you became Pope? the rod that is meant to be used to protect the sheep of God's flock from the wolves that are ravenously hungry to devour their souls. The staff that is meant to lead us to the sacred heart of Jesus, our most secure refuge. It appears to me that you have invited the wolves into the sheepfold and that they are now leading you. I am most deeply concerned about the false teachings that you are communicating to God's people and to others about homosexual relationships. It is true that Jesus ate with sinners, but he never blessed their sins. He never condemned the woman caught in adultery, but just as essential as his refusal to condemn her was his saving words, go and sin no more. I believe that the power of his merciful and just words gave her the grace to sin no more. <laughs> How beautiful. While the language of fiducia supplicans is ambiguous and confusing and misleading about homosexual relationships, the act of a priest blessing a same-sex couple proclaims quite clearly the lie that God blesses same-sex relationships. Even that those relationships are part of God's plan, which absolutely they're not. A true blessing to a man or a woman who is in a same-sex relationship would be the grace to see the sin that they are living in, to turn away from that sin, 
and to seek and receive God's loving forgiveness and healing and the grace of conversion. And that's absolutely true. The Lord loves the sinner, but He requires for us to have conversion. Otherwise, we reject His mercy and ultimately come to perdition. That ain't good for anybody. A true blessing would be for him or her to receive the grace of chastity, to live free of homosexual acts, no matter what their feelings are, to be nurtured by union with the love of Jesus' sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary. Jesus who said, not my own will be done, but yours, Father. Mary, who never once sinned in the whole of her life. How magnificent. Courage International is a Catholic apostolate that seeks to bring these blessings to men and women with same-sex attraction. I am so inspired in reading their mission statement. And I myself, the little cowboy priest, hopes that Courage International is faithful to their mission statement because I know some priests who are in that ministry and they authentically strive, but I'm not so sure about the entirety of that organization, especially as they have caved in some things as of recent. This is the mission statement. Courage members are men and women who experience same-sex attractions and who have made a commitment to strive for chastity. Amen. They are inspired by the gospel call to holiness and the Catholic Church's beautiful teachings about the goodness and inherent purpose of human sexuality, which is absolutely true. I myself have encouraged and wept with, and laughed with, and prayed with, and hoped with persons of same-sex attraction. Through our apostolate, people who experience same-sex attraction receive pastoral support in the form of spiritual guidance, community prayer, support, and fellowship. Surely, Holy Father, the woman continues. Spiritual guidance, community prayer, support, and fellowship are true blessings to a man or a woman with same-sex attraction who wants to live his or her life in God's will. And this prayer she closes with is the prayer of the nine-month novena to Our Lady of Guadalupe that is pushed by Cardinal Burke, the beautiful priest of the Lord. And it is a good prayer. O Virgin Mother of God, we fly to your protection and beg your intercession against the darkness and sin which have evermore enveloped the world and menaced the church. Unite our hearts to your Immaculate Heart so that they may find their true and lasting home in your most sacred heart of Jesus. Ever guide us along the pilgrimage of life to our eternal home with Him. So may our hearts, one with yours, always trust in God's promise of salvation and his never failing mercy to all who turn to him <coughs> with humble and contrite heart. Completed on Easter Sunday, March 31, 20 and 24. God bless to that woman, that little handmaid. 
with a beautiful heart and true sentiment. As I have spoken to countless, countless persons who have said with their own mouth and their own tongue and their own lips those very words that she just expressed. And I recently stumbled across as I was reading the diary of Saint Faustina that we're in the midst of the Divine Mercy Novena. And I found this somewhat shocking and startling and very interesting. This was the entry into her diary December the 17th, 1936, which was the very day that Pope Francis was born. And this is what the Holy Saint Faustina wrote in her diary. I have offered this day for priests. I have suffered more today than ever before, both interiorly and exteriorly. I do not, I did not know that it was possible to suffer so much in one day. I tried to make a holy hour in the course of which my spirit had a taste of the bitterness of the Garden of Gethsemane. That was when such anxiety <clears throat> seized upon our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the anxiety ruptured every capillary in his body and his own blood poured forth like sweat from his pores. The saint continues, <clears throat> I am fighting alone, supported by his arm against all the difficulties that face me like unassailable walls. But I trust in the power of his name and I fear nothing. Excerpt from the diary of St. Faustina, number 823. And it's true that it appears that we find ourselves in the worst of times. In times of tremendous anxiety upon the entire people of God. We ourselves are thrust into intimacy with the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane in these days. But we look to the Lord, and as I've told you time and time again, the fullest, the most full of His expression to us is in the daily liturgy, in the prayers of Holy Mother Church, and in the readings from the daily Mass. And it is poignant and beautiful. <clears throat> Father Clay never plans or orchestrates these readings, they are from Holy Mother Church and they fit perfectly. As I like to say, the Lord is always right on time. And so we're going to read from the, the readings in the Holy Mass today for this day, the 5th of April, 20 and 24, Friday of the octave of Easter, that we may glean instruction and that our hearts may be lifted up. The first reading was from the Acts of the Apostles, the accounts of the early days of Holy Mother Church. After the crippled man had been cured, while Peter and John were still speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees confronted them. You see, this is the same kind of nonsense that we're experiencing today. Real time in our own lives. 
And that's why we can draw strength from the faith and the response of the apostles. They confronted them, disturbed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And we believe wholeheartedly in the resurrection of the dead. In fact, that is our pointed hope. They laid hands on Peter and John and put them into custody until the next day since it was already evening. When did those jokers ever pay any heed to the laws of God or to the laws of the faith? The Pharisees, Sadducees, and high priests disregard these laws of the church and the laws of God as the Democrats disregard to the Constitution of the United States of America just so that you can have an insight to understanding. They use the laws of the church and manipulate the laws of the church to their own end, to their own advantage, to their own designs, to their own plans. But many of those who heard the word came to believe. Amen. And the number of men grew to about 5,000. On the next day, their leaders, elders, and scribes were assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest. You might call him Anus. <laughs> Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly class. They brought them into their presence and questioned them. By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have every confidence in the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Holy Spirit who seals the church from this time until this time. We always trust to God. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. No matter how calculating and insidious the enemies of God are. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, answered them, Leaders of the people and elders, If we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely, by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it was in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified. You see, I told you the other day, the jack wagon, Father James Martin was saying, it was not the Jews who crucified Jesus, who put Jesus to death. They didn't have authority. That guy's an idiot. It was absolutely the Jews. And when we say Jews, what is defined by that most truly? The religious leaders to God's people, the high priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. If you want to call them the bishops of the covenant to Moses, they were the ones who were in the first degree responsible for the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter is accusing them of. So whose side are you on? Peter's or the homosexual James Martin? Answer me that. <laughs> Peter said, leaders of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a cripple, namely, by what means he was saved, then all of you and all the people of Israel should know that it is in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Amen. In his name, this man stands before you healed. He is the stone rejected by the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Amen. We believe. 
That's why we cling to Holy Mother Church. We cling to that cornerstone, to the edifice of salvation for God's holy people, the church, the Catholic Church. There's only one. <laughs> oh, stupid and foolish people. There is no salvation through anyone else. Amen. And that's why, as I constantly exhort you, we have to be solicitous to insist that our family and friends, and even to the stranger, despite what opposition, even if it is from the high priest and the Pharisees, to stay in Holy Mother Church. We do not let the wicked designs of men and their wicked actions to separate us from salvation, to separate us from the Lord. Because he was the one who said, Amen, amen, I say to you, if you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, I don't know you. So anyone who is outside of that covenant, claiming to know the Christ, is sorely mistaken to themselves. They deceive themselves and they are being deceived by another. Señor, ten piedad. Nor is there any other name under heaven given to the human race by which we are to be saved. Jesus the Christ, present to us, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Covenant, new and everlasting, His body and blood, the Eucharist. Jesus is with us. And that's why we make it our business to be adhered to Him, tethered to Him. And we hang tight. We tie a half hitch in that rope and hang on. We don't let go of Jesus. The stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. And to the Holy Gospel, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that's why I constantly encourage you, my friends. I love you tremendously. And it does give me anxiety knowing how you suffer, knowing that just as the sentiments we expressed that that woman wrote in the open letter, many countless of millions of people worldwide share in that same sentiment. Discouraged as the enemy would like to make us. But that's why we have to understand these fundamental and higher order of realities. That the victory has already been won. And that's why we have to push ourselves to stay in the boat with Christ. To keep our eyes fixed on the Christ. And not to be distracted by the raging seas of the world, raging as they are. These things are unbelievable. I mean, who would have believed it? Who would have believed it? Like St. Faustina herself. I mean, she was one of the most holy women in the history of the world. Who was revealed by Christ himself, his sacred heart of divine mercy. And that's why we have to cling to the Lord. She suffered tremendously. And so must we, at great cost, to remain in the safety of Holy Mother Church, even though the bark of Peter is battered and beaten and attacked on every side. The words from the Holy Gospel of St. John. Jesus re revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Listen carefully, because this is speaking perfectly to the interior struggle that we are experiencing. We want to give up. We want to lose hope. We want to just say, to heck with it. 
and go back to our old ways. But this is why we do not. Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples on the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way, together with Simon Peter, where Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we also will come with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. You see, they just went back to their old ways. They said, we'll just go back to what we were before, fishermen, meaning to say to abandon for the opposition, their responsibility and their trust to be fishers of men meaning to say they lost hope we're just going back to what we were we can never do that we belong to the lord we were purchased with a great price and the lord is the one who is true to his promise as we see demonstrated in this holy gospel look what happens next when it was already dawn, jesus was standing on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, No. So he said to them, Cast the net over the right side of the boat, and you will find something. So they cast it, and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. How magnificent was that experience! So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, that's John, God bless John. He was the first to recognize that it was the Lord as he was so deep in his love and friendship to, to Jesus Christ. He knew Christ more intimately than anyone else, save the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment, for he was lightly clad and jumped into the sea. He was so excited. He started swimming to the shore. The other disciples came in the boat, for they were not far from the shore, only about a hundred yards. That's a far swim for little Father Clay, the cowboy priest. A hundred yards is a long swim. <laughs> and the other was with the boat were dragging the net with the fish. And when they climbed out onto the shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. You see how sweet the Lord is? Our Lord Jesus Christ. He prepared a charcoal fire for them and it was with fish on it. And he told them, bring some of the fish I just helped you catch. And he prepared a meal for them because they were hungry. You see, just in the simple ways, the Lord is attentive to us, to our needs. He's concerned about us. And that's why we don't have to be so worried. We can trust to him. Jesus, I trust in you. How many of you are praying the chaplet of divine mercy? And yet, how stricken you are with anxiety and how easily you give yourself into it. That's why I'm telling you, trust to the Lord. Allow for the burden of uncertainty to press down upon you. Or as some have referred to it, the wine press. You are the grapes. And you are placed into the wine press. Allow yourself to be crushed with Christ. And he will fulfill the promise he made. My grace is sufficient for you. He will be the one to hold you up. But the exhibition of faith on our part is what is, it sends the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, his sacred heart, even into ecstasy. 
He loves to see faith and even blind faith. I wouldn't call it blind faith, but it's a faith that is willing to lay everything down. It's not blind because we have the light of these revelations. We are not in the darkness. He has revealed all things to us. So it's, it's not a blind faith, but it's a willingness to submit to the cross. It's a willingness to submit to suffering as He Himself exemplified to us. He Himself who was perfectly innocent, which obviously we are far less. And that's why, my dear brothers and sisters, it's possible for us to, to allow for it to happen. To just say, take me, Lord, I am yours. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. My life is in your hands. As Peter and the apostles exhibited to the Lord. When they stood before the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes. Wicked men who think that they have all the power when in truth they have no power at all. Sons of perdition, foolish beyond any other person in the whole world. They fancy themselves to be the most intelligent, the most educated. And I love the words of that champion of a priest of the Lord of our own time, contemporary to us. He who was given the gift of apostolic preaching, Father John Karapi. And he said of these jack wagon modern day Pharisees, they have educated themselves and into imbecility. <laughs> they have educated themselves into imbecility. They think that they are so intelligent. But even the most simple and the most uneducated person in all of creation has more wisdom than they do. That's very interesting. <laughs> what a beautiful irony. What a beautiful irony. And whenever I'm thinking of those modern day Pharisees, I'm thinking of this one and that one and that one and that other one. I see their faces and I know how ripe they are with arrogance. Every single one of them, the little cowboy priest, Father Clay, could easily sit them on, not sit them, plant them on their ass on the ground because they are no men. And the only thing that restrains me from that is the grace of God. Praise the Lord. But they will get what they have coming to them. And it will be far greater than any infliction of punishment that the little cowboy priest could put on him. And in fact, the punishment of the cowboy, little cowboy priest to them might be the cherry on top. I've asked the Lord many times for that gift. In fact, that is probably one of my, my most frequent prayers as I see the suffering of God's people because that's what weighs on my heart the heaviest the suffering of God's people and even the loss of eternal life. I am tremendously offended by the lack of solicitude of the modern day Pharisees and by their cooperation and pointed commission in the first degree of their offenses to God, to his holy bride, the church and to God's little people. Mm, mm, mm. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come, have breakfast. 
And none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they realized it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them. And in like manner, the fish. This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. Wow. What an incredible and magnificent account from the gospel. I love it. That was on the Sea of Galilee early in the morning with the rising of the sun. I have stood on the Sea of Galilee at that very time in the morning and imagined how beautiful that experience was. I love the Lord with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength. With all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, and all my strength. And I take to heart these words to which he has enjoined to us. I believe in the Lord. And that's why I say to the Lord all the time, nothing of this world will separate me from you. And I back it up with insurance. I go to the Holy Confession regularly. And I don't miss one single day to take in my own mouth the Lord himself. That as he said, I am in you and you are in me. And I know by his strength, I can endure anything of this world. That's why I'm not afraid. That's why even for all the encroaching darkness, I am not afraid. And that's why even to my concerns for God's people, I know that they are in his hands. And that's why I don't go crazy. Without his grace, I would go crazy because it's too much. I think about it all the time. But His grace smooths and covers over my anxieties. And I'm able to sleep and rise again the next day. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking of you. That's true. Lord, you know it's true. Although I am far from a perfect man, you know my heart is pure, O oh Lord. And you know that I love you. And you know that I trust to you. And you know that every word that I have said to your people is true. Praise be to God. So we take encouragement and confidence to these things. And we'll finish with the beautiful words of the psalmist from the office of readings this morning psalm 136 these words are absolutely jam-packed pressed down and flowing over with encouragement oh give thanks to the lord for he is good, for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his love endures forever. Who alone has wrought marvelous works for his love endures forever whose wisdom it was that made the skies for his love endures forever who fixed the earth firmly on the seas for his love endures forever it was he who made the great lights for his love endures forever the sun to rule in the day 
for his love endures forever. The moon and the stars in the night, for his love endures forever. The firstborn of the Egyptians he smote, for his love endures forever. He brought Israel out from their mists, for his love endures forever. Arms outstretched with power in his hand, for his love endures forever. Lord, we ask you to bless the heart of that woman, that sweet woman who wrote the open letter to Pope Francis with arm at outstretched and power in your hand. Hold her above the fray and the masses and multitudes who have the same pain of heart. Bless and sustain your people, Lord. Give them what is necessary to endure this storm. Hold them to yourself. Please, Lord. You who said what the Father has entrusted to me, I will not lose one of them. Lord, we ask your blessing to your people in this tremendous time. He divided the Red Sea in two, for his love endures forever. He made Israel pass through the mists, for his love endures forever. He flung Pharaoh and his force in the sea, for his love endures forever. You see, the powers of the world do not have anything to us, O people of God. You from Ontario, Canada, you from Del Rio, Texas, you from Zihuatanejo, Mexico, you from Auckland, New Zealand, you from Sydney, Australia, and from every, every other place in the world. God bless the cities and the countries of Europe. How wicked the grip of the enemy has seized to these first converts to the faith. How wicked the enemy has seized to these first sons and daughters of the church, the European countries. <sighs> Talk about stupid and foolish people. Lord have mercy, may you raise up new champions, Lord, an abundance of champions from the European countries. Nations in their greatness he struck, for his love endures forever. Kings in their splendor he slew, for his love endures forever. He let Israel inherit their land, for his love endures forever. On his servant their land he bestowed, for his love endures forever. He remembered us in our distress, for his love endures forever. And he snatched us away from our foes, for his love endures forever. He gives food to all living things, for his love endures forever. To the God of heaven give thanks, 
for his love endures forever. And the antiphon, the Lord has rescued us from our enemies. Alleluia. And that's why we have confidence to the Lord. For in fact, His love endures forever. And He unburdens us from our enemies, both foreign and domestic. Both from outside of the church and from inside of the church. The most insidious affront. The walls have been breached by a Trojan horse. The enemies are within our gates. And that's why, my dear people, I encourage you. Because in fact, the church is in possession to you. You are the sons and daughters of the Father from your baptism. And your birthright is Holy Mother Church. And that's why we have to fight for her. And we never relinquish the fight. There are countless numbers of you who, in your own mind, do not have the ability to affect great things because you think that you are too small and you are not able to speak in halls and before tribunals and in courts and in assemblies and in synods. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But in fact, you hold in your possession the greatest power, the Lord Himself, who has His indwelling in your hearts. And you have the power of our Blessed Mother Mary, who was designated to crush the head of the serpent with her heel. You have the Holy Rosary. And that's why I encourage you to pray without ceasing, not to grow wearied, to have confidence to the Lord and even with joy in your heart to pray and with true joy. I'm not talking about a facade of joy. I'm talking about authenticity of joy for in truth the Lord is risen and in truth His promises are fulfilled. We live in the most glorious time. It is when the darkness is its greatest that the light shines the brightest. That's now. <laughs> if ever there was a time, it's now. Even the eclipse tries to put on the facade that it, it blocks the light. It does not block the light. They tell me all about this eclipse. Are you going to see that? Are you going to see that? I ain't going to see nothing of it. I don't care about those things that the pagans got so excited about. I mean, I recognize the beauty of the works of the Lord. But I live in almost in the center of that path, almost in the center of that path. And there are many people from all over the world who are coming to where I am right now. But it, me, myself, I will not be here. I'm going to old Mexico for other business. And that's why I want to tell you, do not be a person who is of the things of this world, of the lower things, but rather that you cling to the higher things. And that you live as a woman of faith, as a man of faith. And that you are more solicitous to the things of the Lord than anything else. And that you put on joy. You clothe yourself with joy. Convinced that in fact He is risen. And that death has no power to us. Death has no power to us. And if we don't have to fear death. What is it that you would fear? <laughs> the Lord be with you. And on this great Easter day, this holy Easter day, and clothed with joy and gladness and hope in every good thing, May the Lord be the one to bless to you, to your mind, to your heart, to your body, and to all your family. May the Lord bless you people with health and strength. And I encourage you to go to the truest medicine. How many times do I have to tell you the Eucharist? Just yesterday I was with a man who 
is suffering from diabetes and heart disease and many other things. And I told him, go to make it your desire and intention to, to pass through any roadblock that would prevent you to present yourself before the altar of the Lord to eat his body and blood the medicine of immortality the true medicine from the true healer the only healer of soul and body and that's why I remind you make the Holy Mass your number one objective every single day and you will not be disappointed and for all these things of which we have spoken, the blessing of Almighty God on this Holy Easter Day, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Adios. Bye.